Hey there, good people. Welcome back to On Code with me, a love for me, where we get real in hopes of building community. In this episode, we're going to talk about medical advocacy. It does come with a trigger warning. We're going to talk about my favorite fragrances for the season. We're going to talk about a great app to help you get things done so you can enjoy these warm weather months. And of course, we're going to talk about a world without men. That should be really, really interesting. And I'm going to share some books along the way. I hope you enjoy this episode. Comment as we go and make sure you like and subscribe before you go. It's spring and so I have a couple of scents for you. For the people who are really uh, into signature scents, who are sophisticated, who really like just the one and done scent and who want to know that they smell good, but also when they smell themselves, feel good. So first of all, this is like my daytime scent or a really, really warm night. I tend to wear the same scent spring to summer. I am definitely not a large perfume collection person. I just want my scents to count. So the first one from Maison Margiela, their replica collection. Um, it used to be called Tea Escape. Now it's called Matcha Meditation. This is a floral with sweet, but also a little bit of earth because of tea. It's that light, sweet scent that's more sophisticated. We're not talking about overwhelmingly sweet, right? Because it does have those flowers. It's nice and still light and it's not powdery in the slightest. It doesn't dry down to powdery and it lasts you all day long. That's my favorite part about it. The longevity is really nice. It is definitely one that is unique in your arsenal and I get all the attention when I wear this. I mean, Everybody wants to know what I'm wearing. I adore it. It's definitely more for that sophisticated person. And then for nighttime, another absolute favorite, and this is new to my collection this year from Parfum de Mali is Altair. Love this so much. This is a vanilla based scent. And when you first spray it, you get a lot more than that. It is very, very complex. And then it settles down into the vanilla and that's what you get the most. That's what lingers for the longest amount of time. This will last you forever scent wise. You only need a couple of sprays. Like I said, this is a vanilla at the heart of it when it dries down, but it has spiciness to it. There are definitely like a little bit of cinnamon, cinnamon and spices coming at you from the top. It is sophisticated. It is that scent catcher. Everyone asks me what I'm wearing when I'm wearing this. Everyone, I get so much attention, it's alarming. It is so good, so sophisticated. And if you are the person who doesn't have a bunch of fragrances but want to make your fragrance purchases count, these are two that I would encourage you to consider for sure. All right, so hopefully I like this. This is the April tea, tea, tea of the month. This is creme brulee. I'm hoping I like it. I've actually gone through two of the 10 so far, so that's good. And the other two are on their way. So we will taste it at the end. It's too hot. I just made it. But I'm laughing. I'm smiling because I want to have this smile before I go into this very triggering topic for me and probably for other people. So there was a trigger warning and I want to give it again. I'm going to be discussing medical trauma from a personal standpoint. I will say the death of influencer Jessica Petway last month triggered me, it triggered my medical trauma. Um, in some of the ways that is not great for me mentally because I do have health issues, right? I don't talk a lot about myself, my diagnoses or anything. I talk about the fact that I have severe anemia and how I don't do a good job taking care of that. I don't call, talk about the root causes. There's more than one cause of that. Um, and since January, I have had a lot of um, doctor's visits. I've been poked. I've been prodded. I've done an MRI or two. Um, I'd be like, why y'all take five vials of blood every time? I ain't got it to give. Um, <laughs> but I'm used to being poked and prodded. And in March, Jessica Petway's passing triggered me, right? And it's because I recognize that we are all her, right? And if you don't know who Jessica Petway is, she is an influencer was an influencer um, in the black space, right? She had uh, done stuff around hair, makeup, fashion, beautiful woman with kids and a husband. 
and um, very open about her religious beliefs as well. And I think it was 2022 when she first opened up to us about the fact that she had been going through this medical stuff. She had almost bled out. Her husband found her passed down on the floor and went to the emergency room. And they told her she had fibroids, right? And that this was a result of fibroids. And they didn't do much examining, right? It was just like, you have fibroids. Even though she complained about some kind of growth or issue in her utero uterus, vaginal area, right? They just sent her on her way. And in between then and getting a diagnosis, she, I think she said she wrote that she had 18 blood transfusions, which is wild. Like there's nothing normal about that. But in that time, like the test she needed, doctors weren't doing until she got to a doctor who was like, well, let's look, let's look under there. And they found a growth and diagnosed her with cervical cancer, stage three, right? And it's infuriating because it took so many doctors and so many infusions for someone to do a freaking test, right? Something that should have been done in the first time, right? A simple, simple test. Instead, they were like, this is a result of fibroids. Black women, if you don't know, have fibroids. A lot of black women. This is a common occurrence in black women, causes, etc. still under research. We're the last people that research, but that is not uncommon. A lot of black women have fibroids. I am not going to encourage anyone to share their medical information. I don't share a lot with you all um, below, but fibroids, paps, um, can't think of the, the right word, endometriosis, etc., are things that a lot of black women deal with and don't get treated in. Or it takes a lot for them to get a diagnosis because this system doesn't listen to us. And this is not conjecture. This is documented, right? Um, uh, the papers, the, the uh, reports say that we are treated like we can handle more pain. We're not listened to, etc. And Jessica Petway is a just sad, just devastating example of someone who you trust with your life, several someones not listening to you. So you are gone and can't be there for your children. And this triggered me for many reasons, but it reminded me how much of an advocate I have to be for myself. And I'll never forget first learning how much of an advocate I needed to be for myself actually by watching my dad battle cancer, right? Um, I'll never forget picking him up one time because he may not be here. If it wasn't for this, he was going through treatment. He'd had surgery. I picked him up from his home because he was like, I need, I think I need to go to the emergency medical center. You know, he had called the doctor and said, Hey, something's wrong. This is after surgery. Right. And I saw him one time, found out they sewed something up, um, that they shouldn't have sewed up. So he was having problems. They pulled it out, whatever, we sent him home with treatment. Called back later and was like, I really think something's still wrong and they told him no everything's okay you know sleep it off and then come back right even though they knew they had screwed up once right <laughs> even though this is a man over 40 and he recently had surgery uh, they were like sleep it off and if he had listened to them he would not be here because we took him to emergency medicine for his insurance provider which if you're not in the u.s can be different from the emergency room right and it got there I went into the room with him. Me and my, I went, my sister waited in the um, waiting room. He described his symptoms and they were like, I think this is going on. We need to put you through um, uh, an uh, MRI, but I think this is what is going on. And in between that moment and him doing the MRI, he passed out and they called an ambulance to take him to the ER. And it turns out what happened, they were like, <laughs> it was just the worst. They were like, well, sir, this is the problem. I'm going to give you this medication. If you live through the night, you will be fine. If you don't, we know this is the cause, right? And he still, but if he had not said, no, I need to go. I need to be more forceful. I need to make them listen to me he would not be here. And that is not the first time I have seen this, right? I've learned this, I've, I've watched it at him, but I've watched it happen with other people and with myself. I almost died a couple years ago, I just don't talk about it. But what I've learned most is that 
You have to stand up for yourself. You have to ask for the test. You have to insist on someone explaining things to you to a degree where you can make educated decisions. Get multiple opinions. This is advice I give people all the time. And I take this advice for myself because I listen to a doctor knowing knowing that I need to get multiple opinions and she about killed me, <laughs> right? Um, I always get multiple opinions. Now, I will drive two to four hours to get another opinion, to see a specialist before I say, mm, yeah, I'm gonna go with this doctor, what this doctor said, especially if I don't understand, especially if they can't explain to me in ways that will help me understand because that is part of their job. And there are doctors who are so good at it and who are so kind and who are, who are so caring. And you just have to find that right doctor. As people of color, because this is something I experienced with my Latina friends as well, they're also very scared to go to the doctor. I One of my friends in her 30s was like, I just went to the OBGYN for the first time. And like before she was going, she was like, wish me luck. And I was like, girl, you're going to be fine. But I think more than anything, I wanted to talk about this because I want us to be advocates for ourselves. We have to go in and get all the answers and not walk away not knowing, not feeling shame around asking more questions, not letting someone's attitude or preconceived notions stop us from getting the medical care we need. And yes, there is a correlation between insurance and medical care, right? Uh, one thing I've realized over time is the better my insurance, the more time I have. And that's the system, right? Right? That's not the doctor themselves. That's the system that they're working under. And the doctors who have a high-end medical practice have more time, you know, because, and I've just seen, like, with better insurance, they're willing to give me all the tests. Whereas when my insurance is not great, a lot of the times, they won't give me all the tests. They won't assume, they will assume that I can't afford it, right? And you, as a person who values your own life, you have to decide to go in and get what you need and let nobody stop you, especially if you are experiencing something that is abnormal. And you could do like me and take breaks. I do that, I avoid the doctor from time to time and my people around me are like, are you blah, blah, blah? And I'm like, no, I'm avoiding the doctor right now. <laughs> Actually, don't be like me, that's probably not a good idea. But I will say you can take a breath. It's your life, choose what you want to choose, right? It's your life. You got to fight because that's all we do. And you know, what does Sophia say? All my life I've had to fight. And unfortunately, that's the life we lead. But especially black folk, I just want us to not worry so much about trusting the medical establishment, but instead worry about being our own advocates, taking people when you need to, confiding in others so they know what you're going through so that if you aren't available, someone else knows exactly what you've been going through. But in the end, understanding the system we live in affects us in multiple ways and medical is one of them. And one thing we can do and learn from people like Jessica Petway, who shared her story so that we could learn, whose, whose family shared her story once she passed so that we can learn, is that we can be advocates. We can push people to listen, to hear us and get the best outcome possible. So let's taste this because that was a lot and I need a moment. You know, we, I'm a G, I didn't cry, but I almost did. <laughs> it has like a, a earthy coffee taste and I don't like coffee, but it's, a, I, I'll get through it, but I'm gonna give this one away. <laughs> I don't like this. any kind of hint of coffee. I, I can't do mm -mm, not me. All right. I'll see you guys in a moment. <laughs> For me, my iPhone is good for so many things. And one of those things is especially surrounding productivity, right? So many years ago, I discovered the getting things done method and I'll link a book below and a blog post explaining more into it. But it's a productivity method that helps you prioritize the various tasks and like buckets of life, right? Um, but the method is very much described in like a paper format where like you have an inbox, like an actual like inbox uh, situation for your mail and all of that. And I, over the years, have adapted it, right, to fit where we are now in a very technologically driven, less paper driven than what is described in the method. So the inbox in the getting things done method is that place where you put every 
single thought, right? Anything, it doesn't matter what bucket it goes into, you get it out of your head and you get it in your inbox so that you can then later sort it and nothing is left behind. You then sort it into your bucket, right? And now there's an app that I use that I can do all of that in and it's called the Tick Tick app. And I've talked about this app before, but I wanna be more specific about how I use it. So I have an inbox, right? And in that inbox, I just put whatever I think of, right? Uh, the other day I was like, ah, oh, I need to buy this, right? Oh, I need to buy more toilet paper. It just goes right there. Oh, I need to write this for work. It all goes in the inbox, right? And then you sort it into the various other boxes you have here. So I have an ideas tab, right? So maybe this is an idea for a video that eventually goes into the software I use to plan out my videos, right? I have a projects tab, right? I am currently spring cleaning my place. And so that is a project where it has multiple steps. So in that projects tab, I have every part of my apartment and I just check it off as I go. And I am a paper girly for planning, but the getting things done method works so well. It is a very well thought out method, but in this day and age, it doesn't work so well to have so much paper, right? And there's an actual inbox, so that doesn't work so well either. Instead, I found an app, the Tick Tick app, that really lets me have the same level of simplicity, uh, but it's all again at my fingertip. But more than anything else, I wanted to highlight that the getting things done method will really help you de-stress because you're getting everything out of your brain and into this one space. And then the Tick Tick app is a great way to achieve the method without having a bunch of paper or just various implements to make it happen. Hey there good people, welcome to A Love For Cuisine. Today I was really feeling like good basic Southern cooking um, and it's translated outside of the South so you guys are gonna recognize a lot of this but it's really basic and just tasty if that makes sense. This is one of those comfort foods I really love. My mom used to make all the time when we were kids but we never got sick of it because it's just tasty. Um, we're gonna start with the potatoes that are on the stove. I had, I put like three, I think, potatoes on the stove to boil. I want them to get nice and nice and soft for mashed potatoes. I'll be honest with y'all. I do not buy mashed potatoes. I always use whole potatoes and make mashed potatoes. It's just so easy that once you learn how to do it, it tastes a lot better and you'd be like, why would I buy a box? Why would I buy a microwavable thing? Now, hold on. Let me qualify that because during the pandemic, when I was living with my sister, those little simply mashed potato things saved us because when you got like eight people in the house <laughs> um, at any given day, it is quite life saving <laughs> to have something quick. But now that I live alone and whenever I'm cooking for someone else, I just make some mashed potatoes. They're so easy. They come together really fast. So like I said, I have a couple of potatoes on the stove. Um, today I'm using chicken leg quarters. And that's a tip for you guys, for those who um, want to save money and who do eat meat, chicken leg quarters tend to be so much cheaper than buying legs or dr or thighs separately because it's the, the, the chicken isn't separated, right? So you've got to separate them, but you can easily do it um, at the joint between the thigh and the leg. Um, today, I really want to do a blackened seasoning. So that's a mixture of uh, smoked paprika, oregano, thyme, garlic powder, onion powder, um, and then of course, salt and pepper. And you guys know I have these, right? I have this salt and pepper mill, which I will be using in a moment. I actually also have salt and pepper in my cabinet there in the shakers, why? Because when I am seasoning meat, I don't wanna stick my fingers in this. So I use the shakers instead. And you'll see, I typically, it's kinda like I have a hand but tied behind my back. This is the way I've been taught. Um, if you don't use tongs, there is one hand that touches the meat and there's one hand that doesn't. Now. You gotta get used to it, like the, <laughs> how to situate that, but I, I do it by taking all the spices out, right? And I've learned to uh, untwist the cap in the elbow of my arm, and I just make sure that I don't touch the spice containers with the hand that has the meat. Massage the, the spice into the chicken, it really adds something. And I'm letting that sit while the chicken comes up to room temperature. So about 
20 minutes, right? I really want it to be up to room temperature for an even cooking. And then for my veggie side, I'm making Brussels sprouts. Um, as you can see, they came in my box. My chicken came in my box, my potatoes came in my box from Fresh Harvest. Like I told you guys, I'm doing it. I'm using this stuff. Um, and that chicken came from a farm in Brazelton, Georgia, which is cool. So cut my Brussels sprouts so that they are trimmed. You wanna cut off the end and you basically like take the little leaves off until you get like a center that isn't um, blemished at all. Uh, and then I'm gonna cut them in half. You might notice that I use my cast iron skillets a lot. I use them whenever I am taking um, food from the stove to the oven. I could use my pots. I have a, a set of pans that go from the stove to the oven, but the way the cast iron like holds the heat, uh, there's no chance of warping. It's just the perfect situation to take a pan from the stove to the oven. And I'm using a 12 inch skillet today for my two chicken leg quarters. Um, I have three different sizes because my brother brought me a, a set as like a housewarming gift. I'm telling you, that's one of the best gifts I've ever received. So if like there's a man in your life, brother, father, whatever, and they're looking for a gift, send them a link to a set. I'm telling you. Now my brother cook a lot. So like he had his own idea of what I needed. Uh, Cause when I moved to Atlanta, I got rid of a lot of stuff. Uh, and I knew I needed a new cast iron skillet, uh, but I was so like, man, this is cool. Thanks for giving me a set. And then I have used that set. Like when I'm cooking one piece of fish, like just one fillet, I like to use the, like the really small one. It's probably like six inches around. Um, I have an eight inch and then the really big one, or I think it's 12 inch. And then the really big one I use whenever I'm spatch cooking a chicken or I'm just cooking something for a lot of people. And it just serves so well. But anyways, now I'm going to add a little oil to these sprouts. Um, I always have grapeseed oil in this thing, by the way. So just add enough oil because when you're um, cooking in the oven, when you're roasting veggies, you do want to be generous with the oil. This is how you get a good roast. Salt and pepper, obviously. Y'all know, salt cellar. I just do a good pinch and then like turn it and turn it and turn it until everything is coated. About the same with the pepper. Um, it's really to your taste, but that's what works for me. And then you just mix and mix and mix until everything is nicely coated. I'm actually going to use the same bowl when I take it out when it's cooked to finish it because I just want to do some like balsamic honey situation. Um, it's just so good, so tasty. And this is one serving tomorrow when I make when I eat the other quarter. I will make some cabbage because I have some cabbage. And yes, you can eat this raw. I do it all the time, it tastes so good. But that's a good way to find out whether your seasoning is good with a veggie, because you can eat most veggies raw or, um, unless they're just too hard, right? You just taste it and you know whether your seasoning is right. Whether you need to add more salt, more pepper. So put that on a sheet tray and I'll be right back. All right, it's smoking. So now I'm gonna put the chicken in there and it's gonna go skin side down and I'm gonna turn the heat down to medium low. You don't wanna crowd it, you wanna give it space. There's gonna be just enough space. Turn it to medium low and let it cook for 15 minutes. So we're starting with the mashed potatoes. You can always warm them, okay? But the thing you can do to mess these up, the only thing you can really do, because most things you can fix, there are only two things you can mess up. One, not cooking the potatoes long enough, which is what happens to a lot of people. I don't even have timing, okay? I don't, because your potatoes will be different sizes. Instead, you just cook them until the skin starts to break apart on its own or fork tender. But a lot of people still get fork tender wrong. So I'm just like, until the skin starts to break apart on its own. And that's also why I don't take the skin off first because I can just peel it off easily <laughs> once the potatoes are fork tender. All right, so 
What you would typically do is make a cream sauce and then put it on there. But my cooking is much more basic. So what I'm going to do is take some butter and put it in there. And I also have some warm chicken broth. And I that was like two tablespoons of butter. And I'm going to use the broth to thin or make it the potatoes creamy, but I'm also going to be melting butter that way. Works really, really well, at least for me. And then you can add cream or half and half to really get the consistency you want, right? So that's like part one. Step one, don't add too much um, broth. I think I just added like half a cup to start. And then you want to go in Add some seasonings, salt, pepper, most basic, right? That's the most basic you, thing you can do. I also add some garlic powder. You can add some onion powder too, just depends on the flavor you want. If you want more color, add paprika, but that ain't, that ain't me. Um, I'm pretty generous with the salt. My broth was a better than bouillon, which is not, depending on the one you, you use, is not very salty. I used it roasted garlic. Um, I used, used it, I used roasted garlic, and then I'm using garlic powder this time around. And be as generous as you want. The good thing about garlic powder is it kind of mimics the flavor of salt when you have salt in a dish. So you can use less salt and more garlic powder, and it works beautifully. But before I, want to, I add the cream, I want to taste it just to see where the flavor is, see if you need to add more salt, more pepper, anything. Mmm, that's some really good flavor. I was about to be upset. <laughs> like a lot of this <laughs> relies on cream and I just knew I had cream. And that's that on that. Like my potatoes are done. Now I'm gonna go ahead and simply start my chicken. But I like to do this first because the potatoes can be warmed, right? They don't lose anything. If you warm them in a microwave, you can cook it all at the same time, but it's very difficult for me to cook everything at the same time and to talk to you guys. So I just went ahead and made the potato. All right, so we've got our pan here, it's hot. So once again, I'm going to make sure I have a mitt. And you see the drippings in the pan? Wonderful. That is what we're gonna use for our gravy. So I'm gonna turn this on medium. It's already hot, so I'm not too concerned. Um, and I want to cook a shallot in there. I freaking love shallots and cooked shallots are just, or, or like sauteed shallots are divine. I also use shallots when I'm making um, a sauce for my crab boils or my shrimp boils. So good. Um, I poured off a good portion of the oil because I just don't need that much or the fat from the chicken, but I'm just going to spray it a little and then let that cook for a bit. All right, those are nicely getting browned. So I'm gonna go ahead and add some minced garlic, push that around for about 30 seconds before I go ahead and add broth. See how those are browned? Nice. Go ahead and add some broth. Get those pan drippings. Turn this down a little. Like I said, the pan is hot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is when you add white wine, if you wanna add white wine, I mean, or red wine, it doesn't matter. I'll probably end up adding like half a cup of broth and then go ahead and season it with some salt and pepper. Always that. Before you add your cream broth, but it should be fine. Let that cook. If it's too thick, add broth. If it's too thin, add corn starch and water. <laughs> Y'all, I had to start without you. Look, I'm hungry and this is absolutely delicious this chicken is cooked absolutely perfectly brussels sprouts like the balsamic adds just the right like you need that acidity like and bitterness really for the chicken and the gravy and the, mm, the gravy 
so good. I did need to remind you guys that if you're gonna put gravy on potatoes, you can't over salt. Um, because I heavily salted the potatoes, I did not heavily salt the gravy. <sighs> so good. The thigh is gone. I just had the leg left, and baby, this is a Sunday dinner. Like I've never cooked one before. This is typical Southern Sunday dinner, and it's just perfect. Now, there are alternatives here. You could literally just salt the chicken and cook it the same way, literally the same way, and then use the gravy as like a sauce over top, especially if you add wine to it or you add lemon alternatively to it, lemon juice. You can use that as a sauce instead. Um, any kind of like nice curry sauce would go over it well. Most of the times, um, a lot of, in fine dining, a lot of people use a salsa verde over top when you cook a chicken like this, but man, this is so <laughs> good and I'm about to be full. This is, this is true Sunday dinner. Like I'm about to be out, okay? <laughs> but that's okay. I know it's time for me to do a vegetarian dish or vegan, so next time we'll do that. But it's so rude to talk with food in your mouth, so I'm gonna continue eating and I'll see you in the next part. 24 in 2024 bucket list. And in Q1, I actually knocked off eight things, surprisingly. Um, I have plant a garden and I did that. I decided to plant flowers and I have so many flowers blooming. Well, not blooming, but like stimming. <laughs> That's what I would call it right now. My begonias, my dahlias. I put some in like just spr sprinkle seeds in pots when it came to a point. I did little greenhouses. So much is sprouting and I'm so happy and I hope I can keep it all alive. I said go to a gala. I went to a gala in DC. That was great. Um, it was just, it felt good to really, really dress up. It was, it was a high profile gala. So black tie, I wore my shirt heels, which are actually quite comfortable unless I was standing on marble, which in DC, there's a lot of marble. <laughs> um, then I learned that nothing can save you. You just gotta keep moving. Um, but otherwise those heels were fine. I wore them like all day. Um, I found a new therapist that was on the list. I know. Hey there, good people. Welcome to Closet Discussions. We have a name. <laughs> it's actually a combination of uh, friends or and subscribers. She said uh, closed discussions. And then um, the woman who has been commenting, who I was like, she gave me some names and I'm like trying to figure it out. So between the two of you, I have named it Closet Discussions. But let me know, do you guys like Closet Discussions or Closed Discussions? And that will be the name moving forward. We will decide this together. So on this episode of Closet Discussions, I want to talk about this video that I did a while ago. I think it was 2022, 2021. Remember I did this video on decentering men in my life? I'll link it below if you don't. But in that video, I talked about how in order to move forward with life as a person who really wants more for themselves, who wants to center my own goals and thoughts as I move forward, I needed to decenter men, right? Decenter the patriarchy in my existence. You have to understand that like when you hit 30 and between 30 and let's say 42, the childbearing years, People are constantly asking you, when are you going to have children? If you're married or not, even the freaking doctors ask me from the age of what, 32, when you're going to have children. I've had uh, doctors encourage me to have children, even if I'm not partnered um, in a Southern state. That that means a lot, right? Um, it, it's just everybody. When are you going to get married? It's a constant when you're in your 30s uh, because we are situating the ideal in all of our minds collectively that in order for a woman to live a filled life, she's got to get married and she has to have children. And people don't realize that they are centering patriarchy and, and traditional marriage when they are asking a person this. They're not concerned fully with whether this person is fulfilled because in their mind, this woman is not fulfilled unless she's having children, unless she's made a decision to have children, unless she's partnered. And so it takes a lot of regular checking in with myself to decenter men and patriarchy from my mindset, from my goals, from what I want for myself for the future. This is ever prescient in relationships and it really baffles like my brother-in-law, my brothers, et cetera. It does not baffle my father. And I think that just has to do with age and wisdom. But I always say love is not enough, right? Because I date, right? There are men that I date for longer than others. Um, and I'm like, yes, I could love them all I want. <laughs> and I tried to explain this to my brother-in-law recently. 
uh, because I don't introduce my family to, to anybody and everybody, right? I'm like, I am not just looking for love, right? I don't think love is that difficult to find. You know what's hard to find? Um, and the older you get, the more established you get as a person. Um, someone who you meet ideally with, like ideologically with, with who you meet at the same level as you career-wise, et cetera. Because as you get older, I find that you are unwilling to compromise on those things. And oftentimes we do compromise. We are encouraged to compromise things that are like ideologically at, at the fundamental core of who we are. And that's how a lot of women end up in marriages that they hate, right? Um, or marriages that their husband does one thing and they do another, right? Or their spouse or their partner. Because we are constantly encouraged to bend and to move more towards tradition and let the man help us decide or choose for us how to move in life. And I, uh, I try to remind them that I am not a traditional girly. And my father being a traditional Southern Christian man gets it. <laughs> He's always like, don't don't settle. Don't choose some man just because you're lonely or just because this like. You know, you got to you got to keep moving. He helps me these center men in my life. And, you know, to do that, I have to ask myself this one fundamental question. And that question is, what would my world look like if men were in it? And guess what? I don't have to guess anymore. There's a whole movement. It's called the 4B movement. And I was introduced to it via TikTok. There's this woman on TikTok who made this video that is like got millions of views now. And she goes, you know, it's funny. Women in Korea, South Korea, are choosing to go extinct instead of being with trash men, basically, is what she said. And I was like, what? And then she talked about the 4B movement. So what is the 4B movement? So I did some research for you guys uh, to be a bit more accurate, based, not just what I've learned, but like to be a bit more accurate. So as far as I can tell, somewhere between 2015, 2016 is when this movement started. And it it is actually like, things coming to a head, the culmination of women being tired of being in danger. So in South Korea, uh, intimate partner violence is at 41%, which is really high. There's a lot of revenge porn, femicide, dating violence, and spy cam sex crimes. And these crimes are barely prosecuted, right? Which means that the Korean government is complicit in these women lives being in danger. They talk a lot about women um, in marriages who are constantly experiencing domestic violence, right? And the movement really gained traction in 2019 when there was this, I think it was a 25-year-old woman who um, had taken a, a, a photo or a drawing, uh, I think it was a photo of a male nude model um, in a class and she shared it online. And that's a sex crime, right? He didn't give consent. And so she was charged with nine months in prison as well as other things. And this erupted because the men, like I said, they get a slap on the wrist, right? And so women were like, hold on, are, we're not only not safe, but you are actually going to charge this woman with a crime for doing something that men do all the time. They were like, no, ma'am, they protested, <laughs> right? And they made a stink about it. But more than that, they organized. They came together and they decided that the problem was a deeper societal problem. They really took lessons from feminism and decided that the customs around and the institution of marriage were the problem. So that led to the realization that patriarchy is the overall problem. And that shed light on how and where they needed to take this fight. And so they decided on four Bs. So in the language in, in South Korea, these four things start with words that start with B, right? They, they're words that start with the letter B. The four things, the four Bs are no heterosexual marriage, no childbirth, no dating, and no heterosexual relationships. But it also does away with a lot of the strict adherence to femininity in that society, right? So uh, there's a really big strict adherence to women never leaving the house without makeup, like even wearing makeup in the house, right? Um, their hair being done, looking feminine, like wearing dresses and, and heels and things. It's not just a custom, it is a societal thing that is expected and keeps you safe, right? It separates you and keeps you safe. And these women were like, mm -mm, mm -mm. we're going to shave our heads. We not wear makeup anymore. And we are wearing baggy clothes. <laughs> so on top of all the rest of it, they are rejecting everything having to do with 
the presentation of femininity, femininity for the sake of patriarchy. Now, of course, the women presenting themselves this way is a loud alarm or what's the word? Like a loud signal to men that these women are part of the movement. And so it is. it has definitely resulted in more violence, right? These Korean men don't like this. They're used to being in control. And part of that control is these women's uh, pursuit of marriage and intimacy and, you know, wanting to be seen as feminine. Now, how, what does it have to do with patriarchy, right? Why is that important? Because the system in Korea, right, the political system set it up. So women make a lot less than men, right? Like even bigger pay disparity than here in the U.S. And women are expected to be home, right? So the society is set up in a way where women don't have power. So women giving up this stuff is monumental, right? In order to survive, they've had to pull their resources. They're living together, right? They're learning to invest in bank together. They are really having to work together, even though they know they're not going to have what they would have if they would just get married, right? To them, it is worth not getting married in order to not experience the violence and terror that they regularly experience. Like to to make this choice, you have to really think about what they are experiencing on a daily basis. It's not small. Now, of course, there is dissent among the ranks, right? Like there are women who do wear makeup when they're not with their four be friends. There are things that women do, but overall there is a level of solidarity that has resulted to the point where this year, 130 Korean schools, South Korean schools are short first graders. Like they cannot fill 130 schools. That is wild considering how little time this has been happening. Like I said, it really took off in 2019. That is a level of solidarity that is unheard of for most of us amongst women in a single society, right? Like to the point where they don't even know what women or how many women are really a part of this movement, but it has to be a significant amount 130 schools to be short first graders, right? (laughs) Like a significant amount. They are ideologically unified, right? So there's no need to create a list or to do a social media post. They are ideologically unified and are making waves more important than anything else. How are they decentering men? They are not doing this to change men. They are doing this to change the society, right? Uh, how society acts towards women, politically, what they are uh, do, right? They want better wages, right? And they're fighting for that. There's so many things they're fighting for. And they're not trying to work with men against men. They, they're they not trying to do anything for men, right? They're focused on them and uplifting themselves and having better lives. And they have definitely decentered men. Like for the most part in the world, their men don't exist. <laughs> and when I first heard this, I was like, wow, this is crazy. This is <laughs> remarkable that they're even able to do this. But there are echoes there. Do you hear the echoes, right? Like the black femicide rate is something we have really talked about in recent years. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that during pandemic in the U.S., domestic violence was at an all time high, right? Um, according to stats, black the black femicide rate went up, right? We are being killed regularly and in large numbers. We have Black women divesting from Black men. We have a reactionary incel population and the manosphere blaming Black women for everything and telling us, you know, we need to be more fit feminine, right? Uh, Telling us that if we change, Black men will change and that we need to raise sons who are different, right? But single mothers are the problem. There is a distinct reaction here, even Politically, right? The birth rate in the U.S. is down. So what's happening? Decisions that are trying to take away our ability to control when we have children or how many children we have. Like that is politically what is happening. I think one big difference we lack is really decentering men um, as a group. And I don't see it happening. I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying this is a difference, right? I think many women in the U.S. still want to be picked, right? Um, whether they invest in traditional marriage or not, most women still want to be picked. I'm not saying I'm any different, right? I still seek heterosexual partnership. I just am not willing to compromise in ways that some may be, right? 
But there is a definitive reaction to even women gathering online and saying, you know, we deserve better. We want this. You, you could see that reaction. It's the trad wife thing, right? Um, there's so many different ways that our society is reacting. And there's also an increase in violence. I think one of the reasons and difference is that we can't agree um, as women as a society, right? One, race is bigger here, right? It's a bigger impediment here. But also religion is a bigger impediment here as well. I'm not saying that religion is bad. I'm saying like it's it's an impediment to solidarity here, right? Because many women believe that their religion is telling them that, you know, they have to partner and they have to have kids, right? And so it's it's near to impossible to decenter men when you have this religious directive. I mean, we constantly talk about the fact now that the black community doesn't move together. There's not a level of solidarity that we once had. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, a lack of shared circumstance, right? We all during segregation, regardless of class, live near each other, right? My dad talks about this all the time, how on his block, he he was with the teachers, right? And a lot of upper class people, but they would just go a block or two over to find the electrician that would fix something for the house or the plumber that would fix something for their house, right? Um, all of them went to church together, right? There was there, even though they were separated by class, they were all in proximity to to each other. So like there was a collective struggle and somewhat of a default community, which we lack now. And I really think it's really interesting to see how these women have made such a change in such a short amount of time just by choosing to live in solidarity amongst these particular rules. And of course, there are women who don't live this life. But like in order to create this change, those women have to not be working against the women in the movement, right? Just like in the civil rights movement, not everybody was in it, right? Not everybody was with it, but they probably weren't working against it for it to be effective, right? It's just really something to watch and look at. And I'm really going to continue to see and watch and see how the society there corrects, right? How politically they correct and if they correct, right? Because they're already short children, right? And in this day and age, that's the workforce that has rippling effects for a while, and the U.S. is seeing those effects and we're seeing a reaction. And uh, because we lack solidarity, I think that reaction is going to be different because there is a Western Fort B movement happening. It ain't the same. As someone who actively decenters men in her life, I'm really going to continue to watch this movement because I think it's really a case study that I, <laughs> I can really see firsthand what happens if men are a factor. It's really, really interesting. And I want to know your thoughts below. Have you heard of the 4B movement before now? And could you ever see yourself just completely divorcing yourself of men in your life, right? Like to the point where a lot of these women have turned towards lesbianism. They talk about that. And more importantly, could you see yourself standing in solidarity for a political ends, for a societal change, right? Could you see yourself standing in solidarity, not getting in the way, right? Could you see yourself doing that? And if you couldn't, why not? I can count on authors in the romance genre to follow a formula that centers on the female reader. There's something about the love story working out nine and a half to ten times that is super comforting. Unfortunately, last year, I noticed a change in the genre. I shouldn't say unfortunately because change isn't a bad thing. However, I really found myself unhappy with contemporary romance for all of 2023. It was either heroines that were unbelievably submissive or heroines that were so flawed that a relationship was the last thing they needed. This is why, at the top of 2024, I decided to delve into the catalogs of unread season authors that are widely acclaimed. You may remember me gushing over the Levesque Family series by Beverly Jenkins. At this point, I've read so many romance novels that I rarely rate anything at the four-star level, but Jenkins brought originality that couldn't be denied. Then I turned to an old favorite, author Mary Wine. Wine often writes witty heroines who aren't intimidated by their Highland counterparts. In these novels, you get old romance. This is so refreshing right now. <laughs> uh, so Q1 is over. And I think the greatest lesson I learned was that life goes at its own pace and any goal worth achieving also goes at its own pace. Like I gotta move through the process. I have this weight loss goal this year and it's not been easy. 
Q1 was full of trial and error and realizing that I have to deal with my medical in order to reach my goal. But I think one thing that I've implemented this year that is really working for me is three simple disciplines or three little disciplines. I got this from an Instagrammer. I'll link her if I can remember who it is. But I am shooting for three things that I do every single day. That is reading, writing, and exercise. I tried to do it all at once, didn't work, right? Like I said, it's a process. And so I realized that for my, even my health goal, I need to find something that I can do every single day with success for 30 days. So in April, I've been doing a 30 day green smoothie challenge and it has worked. In my next video, you'll see um, smoothie packets I created. I'm, I'm showing you guys meal prep, um, but it's working and it's making me feel so much stronger day by day to the point where is it affecting my exercise? It's affecting my eating all because I am actually sticking to something all because I realized that any worthwhile goal is it's a process and it doesn't always mean that it's going to happen right away or that you're going to be successful the first time you try it. Instead, learn and just figure out something you can do successfully for 30 days so that you can experience that success and build on it. And it's something, you know, that's talked about in Atomic Habits. I've read it before, but it's really been illustrated to me this year um, how much I have to let the process happen in order to reach the goal. Now, before we leave, I do want to recommend two books that relate to this video. One, Atomic Habits. Like I said, if you're trying to achieve a habit or any kind of goal, it's such a good book. It's such a good reminder, and I'm going to read it again soon. And then the second one is Medical Apartheid. I talked about how we have to be advocates for ourselves. And I think that book really illustrates why and talks a lot about the system that we live in medically. It's difficult to get through and it's not one I say just pick up and read. I think it's one that might take you the full year to read and that's okay. It is difficult emotionally to, to read. Um, when you read about what the medical system has done to black Americans, it's difficult. But overall, I think it's worth your time. And I'm always like, if you're going to read one book a year, make it count. So I'm looking forward to commenting and chatting with you all below. I am putting out three of these episodes this month to make up for getting sick last month. And I hope you stay tuned for another episode of On Code with me. A love for me.